All right, how's everyone doing today? So this is my video where I'm gonna go over the 19 multiple choice questions we took from the AP test and try to give a little bit of reasoning behind why the answer is what the answer is. So I'm assuming that if you're listening to this video, you've taken the time to read the passage for section one. Uh, there'll be a link on the description of this video to where you can find that, but I assume you've read the basics. So let's scroll down to question one. The function of the adjectives picturesque, line 7, quaint, line 12, and amusing, line 17, is primarily to... Okay, we've got a bunch of options, but before we look at any of them, let's go back to the passage and just read from 7 to 17, all right? Okay. The old houses which were temporary residences of such of the county families as contented themselves... Sorry, we have picturesque grandeur, and that describes the town. With the gaieties of a provincial town crowded the streets and gave them the irregular but noble appearance yet to be seen in the cities of belgium the sides of the streets had a quaint richness so picturesque was used to describe the town there were old houses and they had a noble and quaint richness as in the cities of belgium from the effect of the gables and the stacks of chimneys which cut against the blue sky above while if the eye fell lower down the attention was arrested by all kinds of projections in the shape of balcony and oriel which you can see in a footnote means a type of window. And it was amusing to see the infinite variety of windows that had been crammed into the walls. Okay, so essentially what I'm thinking before I go look at the answers is these houses seem to be described as kind of nice. Which answers match that? All right. The function is to A, introduce a sense of the town's fanciful residential design. I mean, yeah, that seems pretty good. Inject comedy into the description of the town. There didn't seem to be anything funny there. C. Discredit the historical relevance of the town. Well, it's certainly talking about something historical. So this is a type of question you might see pretty frequently. Hey, there's a word in there which has something to do with what I read. But where's the relevance? None of the stuff that we read in that passage talked about whether the town was uninteresting, interesting, you should see it if you visit, etc. So I'm just going to ignore that answer because of the relevance part. Define the character of the town's leading families. Nothing in this passage mentions families except that there were families. But once again, you can start to see a little pattern here. Sorry about that. You can start to see a little pattern here where there's a word that was present in the passage families. But did we learn anything about their character? No. And then I think you have the toughest answer here. Call the supposed modernity of the town into question. Certainly this is a passage which is about the modernity of the town. I'm assuming that you read the whole thing. But the question is, are those adjectives used in a specific sense to question the modernity of the town? Let's go back. The old houses, which were the temporary residences, mm-hmm. There's nothing questioning or critical about that question. So to me, the answer is A. Number two, the main purpose of the repetition of negative diction in lines 21 through 27 and with friends is to emphasize the difference between, so let's read it, lines 21 through 27. They were dark and ill paved with large round jolting pebbles and with no side path protected by curbstones. There were no Lamp posts for long winter nights, and no regard was paid to the wants of the middle class who neither drove about in coaches of their own, nor were carried by their own men in their own sedans into the very halls of their friends. So we are contrasting the streets with what we're seeing in the houses in the previous passage. So we're looking at the negative diction specifically. Emphasize the difference between the crowded streets and empty houses. Well, once again, if you've been paying attention, you should start to see a pattern here. It mentioned streets and it mentioned houses. It never mentioned anything about people being crowded or empty. Now that I remember, I'll read it again, 21 through 27. Nope. I don't see any, and if you don't see it, if I'm being too quick with the passage, go ahead and just pause the video and read it yourself. I don't see anything that could qualify as talking about how many people are where. Okay. Grand mansions in the small town setting 
Well, that's not anything to do with the negative diction. That's what the passage is about. But the negative diction is talking about the streets. And I don't see the streets in either part of this answer. So that's not discouraging. Natural light and artificial light. That's an answer we can throw out. Lights really never mentioned. It says they were dark. Long winter nights. Okay. But that's not how the negative diction is being used. Aristocracy in the middle class. Okay, let's take a look. No regard for paid to the wants of the middle class who neither drove about in coaches of their own nor were carried by their own men in their own sedans into the very halls of their friends. Well, that's pretty explicit. I could read E, but I'm just going to go for D. E, welcoming homes and the dangerous streets. Nothing about the homes has been said to be welcoming yet. So, aristocracy in the middle class is the answer which is most clearly supported by the text itself. Number three, which of the following statements best conveys the effects of the sentences in lines 30 through 34? You know the drill. Let's go up there. 30 through 34. The broad, unwieldy carriages hemmed them up against the houses in the narrow streets. The inhospitable houses projected their flights of steps almost into the carriageway, forcing pedestrians again into the danger they had avoided for 20 or 30 paces. Okay. So, the effect of the sentences. The imagery reinforces a sense of the vulnerability of the pedestrians. Well, that sounds good. They're being forced. Let's take a look at the word choice. Hemmed up, inhospitable houses, forcing pedestrians into danger. That's pretty straight up. Let's check the other ones, but A is looking pretty good. The candid tone removes blame from the owners of the house. Mm, I don't know about candid. And I don't know about removing blame. In fact, it doesn't even mention the owners. The exaggerated diction undercuts the danger mentioned in the previous sentence. Doesn't seem all that exaggerated. For something to be exaggerated, it better say the streets were jumping out and eating people. It's not that exaggerated. The parallel structure emphasizes the unity among the townspeople. What? <laughs> there is no townspeople mentioned, nor their unity, so I don't get that one. Uh, the adjectives illustrate the benevolence of the wealthy. That's the funniest answer we've had so far, because not only is this passage about how the wealthy are not particularly benevolent, but it has nothing to do with this passage. So the answer is clearly A. In relation to the second paragraph, lines 6 through 40, the third paragraph represents a shift. Okay, so we need to summarize these paragraphs in our head. Let's check what the first one is. First, here's the big second one. If you remember, having read the passage, you can go ahead and reread it. But the second paragraph is essentially talking about the distinction between the residences, which are very nice, and the streets, which are not so nice. Okay? And then let's check out the third paragraph. We started with the carriages in the last question. And then it says, At night the only light was derived from the glaring, flaring oil lamps hung above the doors of the more aristocratic mansions, just allowing space for the passerbys to become visible before they again disappeared into the darkness, where it was no uncommon thing for robbers to be in waiting for their prey. Wow, that's no joke. Okay, kind of intense. So, the town's history to the narrator's own history. Eh, we didn't see any words like my or I in the third paragraph, so I'm going to ignore that one. The character's perspective to an omniscient narrator's perspective. Well, we might go over this this year, but clearly paragraph two is not an omniscient, uh, sorry, is not a, a narrator. Uh, you don't know anything about them. It's omniscient. It seems to know things from different times and different places. So that makes it omniscient. So it's omniscient narrator in both paragraphs. A primarily realistic account to a fantastical portrayal. So the question is, do these adjectives fit the paragraphs we have? I would say the second paragraph feels realistic to me. There's no crazy stuff going on. It's detailed, but it's realistic. Um, fantastical portrayal. I don't see anything fantastical here. There's no Harry Potter wands or playing Quidditch, so feels realistic to me. Exaggerated satire to a moment of sincere reflection. What about paragraph two feels like an exaggerated satire? I didn't see anything. It seemed like a straight up description. And then a detailed description to a philosophical commentary. Hmm. Okay, let's check that. Oh no, I've been looking at the paragraphs wrong. Because this is part of the second paragraph. 
Okay, that's why they seem very similar. <laughs> Ignore that. Uh, the traditions of those bygone times, even to the small social particular, enable one to understand more clearly the circumstances which contributed to the formation of character. The daily life into which people are born and into which they are absorbed before they are well aware forms change which only one in a hundred has moral strength enough to despise and to break when the right time comes. When an inward necessity for independent individual action arises, which is superior to all outward conventionalities, therefore it is well known, it is well to know what were the chains of daily domestic habit which were the natural leading strings for our forefathers before they learnt to go alone. Holy cow. So there are some phrases in there which if we go back to the question detailed description to a philosophical commentary. That just seems to fit because of words like inward necessity, independent individual action, outward conventionalities, chains of daily domestic habit, our forefathers. Okay, so none of that sounds like a transition to fantastical portrayal or sincere reflection, but more abstract ideal level commentary. So the answer is D. Let's take a look at question five. The sentences in lines 44 through 50, the daily conventionalities, reveal that the narrator, so you know what we're going to do. Let's go back to lines 44. The daily life into which people are born and into which they are absorbed before they are well aware forms chains which only one in a hundred has the moral strength enough to despise and break when the right time comes, when an inward necessity for independent individual action arises which is superior to all outward conventionalities. Okay. Reveals that the narrator appreciates tradition. Hmm. No, this seems to be talking about breaking out of the chains of daily life. That's probably not something to do with tradition. Deplores the town's immorality. Well, this isn't really about the town. This is kind of just a philosophical diatribe about something else. Admires self-determination. Boy, that sounds good. Forming chains which only one in a hundred has moral strength enough to despise and break when the right time comes, when an inward necessity for independent individual action arises. Sounds like C is the right answer. Let's check D and E. Tends to be mired in custom. No, again, if you understood the literal meaning of this paragraph, it was clear they are not talking about loving custom. And condemns the aristocracy. Uh, nothing about the aristocracy in this passage, just like there's nothing about the town's immorality. So B and E go away. A and D both interpret the passage in the opposite of the correct meaning. The correct answer is C. Based on the second and third paragraphs, lines 6 through 53, which of the following can reasonably be inferred regarding the narrator's understanding of individual character? Okay, line 44. So let's go back to the line to make sure we know what type of character they're talking about because that can be a homonym. It can have two meanings. Line 44. So I go to the end of the sentence, I see it's at the end of the sentence, so I'm going to read the whole thing. The tradition of those bygone times, even to the smallest social particular, enable one to understand more clearly the circumstances which contributed to the formation of character. Okay, so character here meaning personality or attitude. Okay. And in fact, that line said that character is the product of understanding what? Understanding the daily, the smallest social particularity. The inner lives of individuals develop independently of the political climate they are born into. Once again, what that question is asking is, did you literally understand what was said? The passage, if you read it again, again, you can pause the video, read it again, or just play back me reading it. The passage says that understanding stuff about social particulars, i.e. political climate, influences inner lives. So if you understand the passage, it's clear that it means the opposite of inner lives developing independently. It means that they develop in a dependent manner based on political climate. So A is not the answer. The environment that individuals live and work in exerts a subtle but powerful influence on their inner lives. So once again, if you understood the literal meaning of the passage, it becomes clear that B is simply a restatement of what it says. It says that understanding a social environment can help you understand individuals. Looks like B is the right answer. I'll go over C through E, but I'm pretty convinced by B already, just by understanding the passage. C. Moral virtue depends on rigorous discipline and careful instruction. I didn't see anything about discipline, and I didn't see anything about instruction. So I'm going to disregard C. Not even a rich inner life can compensate for wretched living conditions. 
So again, this comes back to understanding the passage. The passage talked about how we understand or how we gain character, not whether it has how much power it has or how important it is in the context of being rich or being poor. So I'm going to ignore D. And it is impossible for individuals to muster sufficient inner strength to overcome political oppression. So once again, E is a test just like A. Did you understand the literal meaning of the passage? Because if you did, you know that A and E are saying the opposite, whereas B is saying the correct answer. Okay, number seven, the metaphor of chains chiefly serves to emphasize. All right, let's check it out, 46 through 51. The daily life into which people are born and into which they are absorbed before they are well aware forms chains. Okay, right there I'm going to stop because I'm seeing the word. So let's check what it was referencing. It's referencing daily life. Okay, forms chains which only one in a hundred has moral strength enough to despise and to break when the right time comes. When an inward necessity for independent individual action arises which is superior to all outward conventionalities. Therefore it is well to know what were the chains of daily domestic habit which were the natural leading strings of our forefathers before they learned to go alone. Okay, so in this case, before I even look at these answers, just by reading the passage, I know chains are daily life. So let's see, chiefly serves to emphasize the power of one's circumstances. Look at that, daily life, social particulars. A is looking pretty darn good. B, pull of one's moral beliefs. Nope, I read the passage, I know that's not true. Limitations of geography, gosh, that's nowhere in the passage. Bonds of history. I could see where a student could get confused and mark bonds of history because obviously one's social particularities are part of history, but one's circumstances are a much more direct link to what the passage is talking about, and then continuity of time. I don't understand how you could possibly think that's the answer. So clearly the answer is A. The lines 67 through 69, the statement in parentheses, bend to here, most clearly conveys a sense of, you know what I'm going to do? Lines 67 to 69. Okay. So, and, and again, it starts in the middle of a sentence, so I'm going to go to the start of the last sentence. So the grand old houses stood empty a while, and then speculators ventured to purchase and to turn the deserted mansions into many smaller dwellings fitted for professional men, or even, parentheses, bend your ear lower, lest the shade of Marmaduke, first Baron Waverham here, into shops. Okay, so this parentheses usage, before I look at the answers, is something like... Uh, the narrator pretending to talk to the reader and pretending to be subtle. So it's a kind of a cheeky thing to do, right? Um, it's like if you're making a joke and you say, and I hope, you know, whoever the joke is about. So if you're making a joke about me, you're talking to your friend, you say, you know, Mr. D's class, parentheses, and I hope Mr. D isn't even around to hear this, and then you make the joke. So it's a little cheeky, it's a little funny. So let's see. It most clearly conveys a sense of petty gossip hmm I don't know if that parentheses was petty gossip it wasn't like we were talking about you know who's dating who so gossip just doesn't feel like the right word a respect for the dead okay like I said when I was reading the passage that that was a cheeky funny parentheses so respect is the wrong word mild distraction I, no, it's not like the parentheses was them cutting in and saying, boy, I would really like a Twinkie right now. Uh, D, awe of powerful men. Uh, so we need to go back to the sentence because that's the most tempting answer, right? Because it sounds like, you know, the shade of Marmaduke is somewhat powerful. But in the context of the passage, um, this is a passage about old houses being turned into smaller dwellings for non-lords, right? non Marmadukes of the world. So it's actually about Marmadukes becoming less powerful and less influential in the city. So if you read the passage carefully, though powerful men are mentioned, once again, as with all wrong answers, there's some part that's wrong and there's some part that's right. The powerful men is right, but this is not about awe. It's actually about diminishing awe, lessening awe, which leads us to the correct answer E, that this is about mock fear. That because the town is changing, you no longer fear people like the Baron. So the context of the rest of the sentence was so necessary to understand why E is the right answer. Okay, number nine. The narrator's perspective throughout the passage might be described as that of... Okay, so 
we got to throw out the passage question. We don't have to go scrolling up and down to the passage again. You just need to remember the whole thing and put it in context. So let's think. A, an enthusiastic investigator. What were they investigating? What was the mystery? In fact, it doesn't sound like there was a mystery to begin with. It sounds like they just know everything. A fantastical storyteller. Once again, we see that word fantastical. What question was that from? That was from, oh yes, answer C for question four. I don't know why they keep asking about fantasy. There's no fantasy. A pedantic historian. Okay, so what we see here is that number nine is a vocab test, right? You're taking this test, it's the AP test, you're stressed out, and you see that word pedantic, and you're like, what does that mean? Uh, and that's tough. We'll get better at vocab this year, but if you're curious, it means uh, childish or, or willing to fight. So once again, you're noticing a pattern because you're smart. Part of this answer is right, and part of this answer is wrong. This is a historian. They seem to know what they're talking about, but they are not pedantic. They don't seem like they want to fight. And the people who made this test said, I bet some portion of students don't know what pedantic means, and we'll get them with that one. So unfortunately, if you don't know the, the vocab, you got got, but it's wrong. D, an interested commentator. Ooh, that sounds good. They're definitely commenting on the town, and they definitely seem interested. They definitely seem, you know, focused. So that's good answer. And then a former resident. We know nothing about the narrator, so not sure why I would mark that. Correct answer, D. And now, question 10. In relation to the first sentence, lines 1 through 5, the remainder of the passage serves primarily to... Okay, we got to check 1 through 5. Dude, that was like 12 minutes ago. Where the hell am I? Okay, let's go back up. There is an ass-sized town, or oh, ass-sized, in one of the eastern counties, which was much distinguished by the Tudor sovereigns, and in consequence of their favor and protection, those are two positive words, attained a degree of importance, another positive word that surprises the modern traveler. Huh, well, why would it surprise the modern traveler? It wouldn't surprise you if I said that 200 years ago, New York City was full of importance and favor and protection. Why is that? Because New York City still is cool. So when you see that word surprises, that's the clue that if you read the whole passage, you know that it's about the town kind of sucking now. So let's take a look at question 10. The remainder of the passage serves primarily to explain why the assized town is no longer a popular tourist destination. We never talked about tourism. Reassure readers that there is nothing disturbing about the history of the assized town. I don't know. I mean, we read some disturbing stuff like, you know, robbers being forced into the street by narrow passages, no lights on the streets, people leaving. And frankly, Lines one through five kind of make fun of the town, so B is wrong. Explore the circumstances that account for the assized town's great political and social prominence. Once again, a classic right and wrong answer. In fact, the first lines explain the circumstances. Let's go back. The first lines were, it was distinguished by the Tudor sovereigns and that it was given favor and protection. So that's the right part. If you read the whole passage, you know the circumstances that account for its great political and social prominence. But that wasn't the question. The question was, what does the remainder of the passage do? And it's the first five lines that do what C says, not the rest of the passage. Classic example of some right, some wrong. D, justify the claim that the visitor would be surprised by the history of the assized town. Huh. How would one justify that claim? How would you try to explain that a visitor would be surprised? Well, I would be surprised if you told me that, let's say, Lexington, Kentucky used to be the capital of the United States. Why would that surprise me? Because it had changed a lot. So. The question is, does the remainder of the passage serve to explain how the town has changed or why it is no longer awesome? Yes, that's exactly what we read about. We read about it being nice, but having some downsides and not being super fun. And then eventually the people left. Okay, 
that justified why I would be surprised by the history of it being an important town at one point. Because now, it kind of stinks. So the answer is D. And then document the living conditions prior to the Tudor era. No, we don't have anything prior to the Tudor era. The Tudor era is the first era we're talking about. So the answer is D. Okay, this transitions us to part two of the, our review. As we move to question 11, we see that we are supposed to be reading the poem to be of use. I'm going to assume that you've read this poem. You can Google to be of use, and I'll reference it in this document here. If you haven't read it, why don't you pause the video right here to read page one, unpause it, read page two, and that's it. So if you need to read the poem, here's your time, but I'm going to keep continuing on as if you've read it. All right, question one. The poem as a whole is best understood as A, a eulogy for a lost age of real work. Okay, so again, this is a vocabulary test. You need to know what a eulogy is. A eulogy is a speech delivered at a funeral. So obviously it's a speech which uh, memorializes something that is lost. Hmm, does this poem talk about the fact that we can't work anymore? No, in fact, it doesn't really talk about time at all. I mean, again, I guess there's references to Greek amphoras and Hopi vases, uh, but it seems like this is mostly in the present and that the speaker's opinions about work seem to apply to any time. So A doesn't seem correct. Plea for work to be less burdensome. Boy, that's a test of whether you understood the poem or at all or not. If you read this poem and you think that she wants work to be less burdensome, how can you explain lines like, I love people who strain in the mud and muck to move things forward? Sounds pretty burdensome to me. Vindication of the humanity of workers. Um, I could see that being a tempting answer, seeing as it seems naturally implied that if you like workers, that that would mean that you value their humanity. But at the same time, vindication is another vocab word, which is testing your knowledge. Vindication meaning a defense or a kind of justification. So that is a really tempting answer, honestly. But I don't think it's about the workers. This is probably more a poem about work than workers. She does talk about people, but she rarely talks about their humanity. So tempting answer, hard answer. If you put C for this, I could totally see why you got it wrong. Uh, celebration of earnest work and workers is a kind of better answer. And really the distinction between C and D here is the question of vindication versus celebration. Certainly that words that are used in the poem like love uh, speak far more clearly to celebration than vindication. And then defense of unusual types of work and workers. I mean, we don't have like a defense of welders here, which isn't even that unusual. We don't have a defense of underwater basket weavers here. That, even that would be more unusual, but we don't even get that. So it seems to me the correct answer is C. In context, ooh, yay, we get to go back to the poem. In context, dallying in the shallows, line three, most nearly means, let's go there. The people I love the best jump into work head first without dallying in the shallows. So this assumes you know what the literal meaning of head first is, or actually, sorry, not the literal meaning, the figurative meaning. The figurative meaning of head first is doing something immediately. So dallying in the shadow, shallows, i.e. the part of a beach which is not very deep, uh, as opposed to the deeper part, would be kind of waiting to do your work. I think we can all understand that, especially being Bellarmine students. Ayo. So, question, uh, sorry, answer A. Misunderstanding an assignment, no. Waiting for worthwhile work, no. Lingering over satisfying labor. Um, lingering is a tempting word, right? Because what dallying in the shallows means is like not diving into work. So you are lingering, but you have to notice, again, this is a kind of right, kind of wrong answer. Dallying in the shallows is about lingering. But it's not about lingering over satisfying labor. That would mean like, oh my god, I love doing my ELAP homework. I just don't want to stop doing it. As opposed to lingering and not doing satisfying labor, which is what the passage is actually about. So that's a tricky one. Pretending to complete a job. I don't know about dallying in the shallows is not pretending to swim. Like if you're standing up to your ankles, no one's convinced that you're swimming. And then finally, E, a defensive, uh, sorry, hesitating to perform a task. And there we have our simplest answer. 
uh, which is most clearly aligned with what we thought before we even looked at the answers. The answer is E. 13. In line 5, that element refers to both. Yay, we get to check the poem. Okay. The people I love the best jump into work head first without dallying in the shallows and swim with sure strokes, almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, comma. Okay, if there's a comma, we're not done with that thought, so we should probably keep going. They seem to become natives of that element, the black sleek heads of seals bouncing like half-submerged balls. So in this case, element is referring to water in some way, but let's see. It refers to both water and work. Boy, that's a pretty convenient answer. Uh, but let's read the other options just in case. Love and labor, never mentioned. Mud and muck, that's essentially like you just didn't realize that mud and muck was in paragraph two. Um, answer D, skill and strength. Again, like you didn't read the poem or maybe you thought this was coming from paragraph two. Uh, and wind and tides. Don't know where you got, would have gotten wind. The answer is a pretty clear A. Which best describes the difference in the way people, lines one and eight, are characterized in stanza one versus stanza two? So now we have to read both lines. The people I love best jump into work head first. So we're talking about people who are willing to work, and then let's check paragraph two or stanza two. I love people who harness themselves an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who did do what has to be done again and again. So that's more about like perseverance is what I would label that. So let's look at the answers. Which best describes the difference in the way people are characterized? Rapid movement versus, versus wearied stasis. Okay, so that's another vocab question. To answer, to see whether you know if this answer is correct, you have to know what the term stasis means, which means a standstill or a stalemate. So rapid movement sounds correct. Oh my God, look what we ran into. Another half wrong, half right answer. Rapid movement seems descriptive of stanza one, but wearied stasis doesn't sound like stanza two. Stanza two, people are achieving things. It's just hard. So that's wrong. Supple grace. Supple grace versus undisciplined power. Hmm. So again, this depends on your reading of stanza two. Maybe stanza one is supple grace, but not really. But really the problem is, is stanza two about undisciplined power? I don't think so. It's about patience, it's about strain, but it, it's not undisciplined. Eager activity versus plodding exertion. That sounds exactly like what we said before we read the answers, so C sounds pretty good. Plodding is another vocab word that you might need some help with. It means slow, which is exactly what an ox or a water buffalo is like. Measured patience versus hopeless resignation. No, stanza two is not about resignation. Innate enthusiasm versus thoughtful neutrality. Uh, nothing about stanza two is thoughtful neutrality, whereas A, innate enthusiasm, sounds good. So another half right, half wrong answer. The answer is C. In the poem, the term parlor generals most probably refers to individuals who, let's take a look at line 15. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along who are not parlor generals and field deserters. Okay, so another vocab test. You have to know what a parlor is, which is like a room, usually with furniture for entertaining people, as opposed to a field. So if I was a parlor general, but a field deserter, I am someone who is willing to talk about something while in the comfort of a home, but I'm not willing to go out into the discomfort of the outside world. Boy, they got me nailed to a T. <laughs> That's why I teach literature, but, in the context of the question, who does it refer to? Well, the stanza itself is about working outside with other people in a common rhythm. So these would be people who are not willing to help out. So let's look at the answers. 15, A, behave with unrelenting valor on the battlefield. So that's to test if you realize that this is a metaphor or not, right? If you just see the line parlor generals in question 15 and you see the word generals, maybe a small portion of you are like, battlefields, cool, that's the answer but obviously that's not. View their work obligations as enforced military service. Again, if you read the passage, there's not much to help you with that interpretation. That's just, ooh, I saw the word generals. C, have retired from illustrious careers only to be forgotten. Okay, once again, this is like, did you read the passage? Because this has nothing to do with retiring. I don't even know how you would come up with that. 
have performed deeds because they sought public praise. Again, nothing about praise in this passage right here. Uh, hold forth on experts on work they have never accomplished. Okay, so now we're getting back to work. <laughs> like, it should be a big clue that the answer is E, insofar as it is the only <laughs> answer which mentions work, uh, which is what the whole poem is about. But it also matches what the context of the line is, where a general would theoretically be an expert about battle but not be accomplishing it out in the field, okay? So the answer is E. The word submerge, line 12, most clearly echoes which earlier line from the poem. So let's look at the context of line 12. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, okay? Line two, jump first. So jump into the work head first, submerge in the work. That's tempting, right? Because if you go into head first, to something, you're going to be covered in it. You're going to be submerged. Hmm. Okay. Sounds pretty good. Uh, how about B? Line six, the black seals. So submerge in the work versus, sorry, got a little turned around there. Submerge in the work versus the black heads of seals who are natives of that element. I don't think that being submerged is like being native. To that element necessarily. I'm liking A still. Line eight. Uh, this is back to the ox with a heavy cart. Now submerged. The ox is not an image of being submerged, but an image of uh, perseverance. Line nine. Who pull with patience? Again, I don't think being submerged is about patience. And then line ten. Who strains? So that's another line of perseverance. You should eliminate C, D, and E just from the fact that they all say essentially the same thing. They're all from the ox metaphor. So if the ox metaphor was the correct answer, how would you know which one was correct? So it's down to A and B, and I would say that B is a line about the seals, which is about like something feeling natural, versus A is about eagerness. And submerging in the task who go into the fields to harvest is about the eagerness of doing the work as opposed to talking about it like a parlor general, and as such, the answer would be um, A. One effect of the shift in the speaker's focus in the third stanza is to, so remember, we should have a mental map of the, stan of the poem going, that stanza one was about kind of jumping into the work, uh, stanza two was about the perseverance of the ox, and then finally, stanza three that we read was about uh, kind of teamwork. So A, introduce the idea that dedication to a task is a quality valued by most people. No, this has been a poem that is entirely about the personal opinions of the speaker, not necessarily other people's opinions. Imply that people are obligated to help others whenever they can. You know, I think a kind of vocab test here is obligated. Obligated is like you have to help others. It's, it's kind of the narrator's opinion that they like it, but they haven't been talking about you should help others. It's more of a personal opinion. C, argue that it is better to be a follower than a leader. Hmm, that's tempting. The third stanza is about working as a group, but it's not exactly clear whether there are any leaders or followers. It's more about working in a common rhythm or passing and working in a row and passing the bags along. So though that's tempting because groups generally have followers and they have leaders, that's not what the passage says. D, emphasize the value that the speaker puts on the act of collaboration. Ding, 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 ding. When you have words like common rhythm and work in a row and pass the bags along, uh, that's talking about collaboration. So we can check E, but the answer is clearly D. Lament the speaker's own tendency to words, thought, instead of action. We get no words that tell us about the speaker, so we can ignore that. All right, question 18. In lines 20 through 21, the speaker suggests which of the following about work? A, oh, we should read that passage, sorry. <laughs> uh, the work of the world is as common as mud. Botched, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust. Okay, so there's a lot of work, and when you mess it up, when you botch it, it smears. It creates an unpleasant sensation. But the thing worth doing well done, hard phrase right there, the thing worth doing well done. So if I'm trying to kick a ball and I kick it really well, or in this case, let's talk about something that's doing work. If I'm writing an essay and I write it really well, 
It has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Okay, let's take a look at the possible answers. It can have aesthetic value. Ding, ding, ding. What you're noticing is another trend. It's a vocab test. Do you know what the word aesthetic means? You're certainly going to learn this year, but if you didn't know when you took these questions, it's going to be pretty hard. It means it's beautiful or it is artistic. Mm -hmm. That sounds okay, right? This is about work uh, satisfying or being clean and evident. Uh, you know, we might talk about a piece of art being satisfying. It may bind people together. Mm, no talk about multiple people there. Talks about being satisfying, but nothing about tying people together. Its benefits can be elusive or hard to find. No, I mean, the benefits are right there. It satisfies. It is rarely well done. No, I mean, sometimes it is well done. It should express the worker's feelings. Don't know how you could possibly give that answer. So to me, the best answer is A. Finally, we're almost there. Uh, question 19, the speaker mentions wine or oil in line 22 and corn in line 23 to highlight. Let's check it out. Greek amphoras, vocab test. What's an amphora? It's something that could hold wine or oil. Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. Okay, so in this case, wine is something held within the amphora, corn is something held within the vase. So that's their commonality. It is mentioned to highlight the misguided values of many museums. Weird, no. Useful commodities supplied by work. This is tempting, right? It's super tempting to say, this person loves work, okay? So clearly, they're using those words to describe how work gives you useful commodities. But remember, these are not lines which talk about wine or oil or corn as the main subjects of the sentence. The subjects for the sentence are the amphoras and the vases, okay? There's nothing about work there. There's only stuff about the work performed by those objects, which is why C is what makes a clearer link to that line that those objects have a functional nature, i.e. a usefulness, that is given by the objects, not the work. Okay? So I think this is a really hard question. I could totally see if you put B, but the answer is C because the line is about objects, not about the commodities. The commodities, yes, are there, but they are to talk about the functional nature of venerated objects, especially because of the last line, you know they were made to be used. So if that question teaches you anything, it's that even though the question asked you about lines 22 and 23, finish the thought by reading line 24, and then it will become clear that this is a passage, this is a sentence about the functional nature of the objects, not necessarily the usefulness of wine or oil or corn. Okay, and then enigmatic purpose, corn or wine and oil is not enigmatic, that's a vocab test, it means weird. And then artistry implicit in mundane items. Um, I don't think amphoras or vases are mundane items, like, I don't know, scissors or water bottles. Uh, so, E doesn't seem as correct. But I think that's the hardest question on the entire test. Anyway, I encourage you, if I went too fast on any of that or my references to either of the passages were too quick, again, pause the video. But that's my review of the 19 multiple choice questions and my reasoning behind the correct answers. Uh, thanks for listening.